All right, guys. Hopefully, uh, the volume's going to be all right. You might have to turn it up louder. I don't know. I've tried to mess with the settings, and I'm just going to leave it at this. But I'm excited to finally be using the whiteboard again, and so I'm going to continue a study that I worked on a long time ago about the deity of Christ, and there's still some unfinished business as far as that goes. But I talked about the titles of Jesus that point to his deity, and I talked about the I Am statements, and I talked about... Um, you know what? <clears throat> kind of in a blank, but there was a handful of things I've went over already, and you can find them on the channel if you search for them. But uh, this is the first time, too, with using uh, all the lighting that I have. I'm really blessed that I've had these whiteboards donated to me, these, uh, you know, dry erase boards. Uh, the first one that I had that I've done all the videos with previously when I lived with my mom, I, uh, when I moved to my apartment, you know, it was kind of a rush, and put it in the truck, uh, wedged it between like a couple of dressers or something like that, and hoping it would stay in place, and didn't really put straps on it and stuff, and the wind knocked it around a bit, and it got scratched up, unfortunately, like in the middle of it, tried to get some kind of whiteboard paint, I thought maybe it would fix it, it didn't really work, so I got another uh, whiteboard donated, so, and uh, I still have the other one that I, I plan to use too, and Anyway, um, and I've had some lighting donated to me that I've got four different uh, box lights, one on each side, and I try to get rid of the glare. I wanted to get rid of the glare and have it brightened up, and I could maybe have the lights in closer. It's still a little bit dark, but it's, uh, as you can see, there's like no glare on the whiteboard, so I love that, and I think this is my first time using it since I've got the two extra box lights. And then I got like two umbrella lights, uh, two like photography lights that I use those in my other videos. Um, basically, I've been using them for my One True Misfit movie reviews, and so they work great for that. You know, they're not as bright as these box lights, and so. But it's just I'm just saying if <clears throat> if you have a whiteboard, if you're not really experienced with filming it and stuff and the lighting, then it is pretty tiring because you know you got the glare and you just you have to work it out but I've you know googled it and the suggestion is to have four box lights and this works really great so um, anyway so I'm excited that you know hopefully I'm going to continue on more studies like this you know I've recorded some videos with my phone going through Hebrews and I did like the dual video thing recording me and then recording you know the Bible at the same time and so I'm still going to experiment with a lot of different things, but I want to get back to the whiteboard. I want to get back to a lot of doctrinal studies and stuff like that. And um, I've always thought the whiteboard is good for presentation. And basically, I've just used it just to write scriptures down to show you, um, you know, and to categorize things. But really, it would be good to have like charts and stuff for examples. But you know, I'm not going to be doing like dispensational charts and stuff really. Um, but I don't think that I've used the full potential at all, uh, but it's, it is great for pre presenting things. But I want to talk today about more about the doctrine of Christ, the deity of Christ, as I mentioned, and talk about how Jesus is worshipped as God in the Bible, and that's one of the proofs of his deity. Okay, There are a lot of people that call themselves Christians, and for whatever reason, they don't believe that Jesus is God. They'll say Jesus is Lord and that um, you know they, they follow Jesus or they serve Jesus or that Jesus is our example they call themselves Christians but they do not believe in the deity of Christ and so there's lots of different groups like that and you know obviously even atheists you know they don't believe in God so they wouldn't believe in the deity of Christ they might say you know historians will confirm that you know Jesus lived and he was crucified but they don't believe that he was divine and so you know the scriptures tell us that he's divine in many ways and uh, the fact that he was worshipped as God is, you know, one of the great proofs of that. And so this should be somewhat of a short, short, short study, but, you know, I've already rambled on and wasted some time. So there will be, uh, you know, it'll probably drag on for a little while. But there's not a whole lot to it, but not as much as, like, the titles of his deity. There's still other things I want to look at, how he's equal with the Father in different ways, and he's equal... Uh, you know, with the Father as in regards to the church, and uh, there was something else, I think. Basically, his uh, attributes, his divine attributes, I've kind of went over that previously. 
on a Trinity study showing the divine attributes of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And um, I want to continue more on the doctrine of Christ, you know, besides just proving his deity, but also talking about his person, talking about how he is eternally the Son of God. I started studies on that not too long ago, well, months ago, I don't know. But, you know, I talked about what it means, the, the Father-Son relationship, and I want to talk more about the eternal sonship of Christ and the eternal generation and the, the submission to the Father. But, uh, so I want to do the, that Jesus is worshipped as God. And, you know, those of us who are Christians, that we believe in the divinity of Christ, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and, and to us that means that he has a divine nature. And, you know, we worship God. We worship Jesus as God. You know, we pray in the name of Jesus. We pray to Jesus. Um, you know, we see Jesus as divine. And we worship God and word and deed, and uh, we serve him. And so, you know, we give thanks to God for everything, and we pray to God. Um, and so uh, why not just start this off with a prayer and uh, ask for, you know, the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the study. Dear God, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to go over your word. And I thank you for uh, the people who will view this video and uh, giving me the motivation to do this. Thank you. Very grateful. I love studying the word. And I pray that anybody, you know, who watches this will uh, also share that love. And that I pray that anybody who denies the divinity of Christ today will be persuaded uh, by your word. And, um, God, I just I thank you for your son and for the sacrifice. And please, God, um, you know, we worship you. We worship your son. We worship uh, the Holy Spirit. We, pr I pray we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that the, the Holy Spirit, you know, you'll guide us today and open our eyes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, start off with, Matthew 2.11, which uh, talks about Jesus being worshipped as a baby. And uh, this doesn't necessarily talk about him being worshipped as God. And, you know, I want to say that there's also people who will say that, yeah, Jesus was worshipped, and they'll still deny his divinity. You know, they'll say he was worshipped, like, in the sense of a king, because they'll say he is Lord, but he's not divine. And they'll say that, you know in the sense that a person would kneel before a king, we would kneel before Christ, but that does not proclaim his divinity. But we're going to look at verses that straight out, you know, point towards his divinity and um, with worship. But Matthew 2.11 says, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, they didn't worship Mary, they worshiped Christ, and so uh, that was uh, kind of the beginning of what we read of, you know, after the incarnation of him being worshiped by men. But first of all, let's look at the fact that Scripture states that only God is to be worshiped, because this is very important. And so we're going to look at some different Scriptures that's going to kind of set up a framework so that we can understand that um, when it talks about Jesus being worshiped, you know, by men of God and such that uh, it's important to know that only God is to be worshipped. So, only God is to be worshipped. Okay, this is going to be kind of a mess on the whiteboard. I'm just I don't want to be in the way of it. I don't want to move around a whole lot, but okay. Uh, it's commanded in the Old Testament. We're going to look at two uh, verses here, basically talking about this. It's going to be Deuteronomy 6:13. So uh, Deuteronomy 6:13, and we're going to look at Matthew 4:10. Is that right? Okay, so, no, this is all together here. 
Deuteronomy 6.13 says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. So fear the Lord God, serve him, swear by his name. Okay, so it's commanded in the Old Testament to, to fear or to worship or to serve only God. That's basically the gist of that passage. And then in the New Testament, Jesus affirmed what was said in the Old Testament. In Matthew 4.10 it says, Then Jesus, or then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And so the term fear, when applied unto God in the Old Testament, signifies any act of religion, whether external or internal, and uh, though the last words uh, in Deuteronomy, thou shalt swear by his name, is not mentioned in Matthew, okay, Jesus didn't, you know, it's not recorded that Jesus said that, that last part of Deuteronomy. He's not quoting it word for word. He's just quoting, you know, the just of what that verse says, is that basically only God is to be worshipped. He's not going to worship Satan. He's not going to bow down to him. And um, so falling down and worshiping only belongs to God. That's what he meant. And uh, we see that worship and serve are used kind of interchangeably. And that just makes you think, you know, I always go back to this and jump around to different doctrines and stuff. But, you know, the people who want to say that basically you can be born again, you can be saved, and you don't have to worship God. Or, you know, you don't have to serve God. That's not a part of, you know, being saved. But it is. the it's all over scripture. They can't be separated. Those who are saved worship God. And so they, those who are saved serve God. You know, we serve God with our lives. We don't serve God perfectly. Uh, you know, we falter left and right around every corner. But the fact of the matter is that those of us who are born again, we do serve Christ. And initially, you know, when we came to Christ, we were making that commitment or we were making that um you know, we were confirming that Christ was Lord. We were confessing that Christ is Lord, which means that uh, we were putting ourselves under his lordship as servants to him. And so, basically, you know, that's kind of on the side, but, you know, we see fear the Lord and worship him, serve him, and they're all kind of together. And... You know, Jesus also said, you know, he warns men against serving God and mammon in Matthew chapter 6, 24. And so, again, we see, you know, serving God. There's like, you're either serving God or you're not serving God. So you're either born again or you're not. And if you are born again, then that means that you're serving God. Okay. And um, it's interesting, you know, you know, Jesus said basically if you bowed to him, that he would get all the kingdoms and have all the power over the earth and everything. And, but by serving God, Jesus obtained all earthly authority which the devil offered him, and heavenly authority in addition thereunto, in Matthew 28:18. So much better are the rewards of God than Satan's. We need to remember that, you know, God's eternal rewards are better than any temporary thing. And, you know, God loves us. God wants what's best for us. God knows what's best for us. He created us. And so that's why, you know, we're to serve God and, um, you know, Thank God for his promises. Thank God for his love, for his mercy, for his grace. And so I also want to mention this by saying that when Jesus told Satan that only God is to be worshipped, he was not excluding himself from divinity. He was not saying that he was not, in fact, divine. Okay, um, Jesus is divine. And so if somebody tries to say that that verse or any, or any verse where, you know, it's mentioned that, you know, Jesus, you know, prayed to God or whatever that that excludes Jesus from being God. It's not true. But so we see that the Old Testament says that only God is to be worshipped. And Jesus was born a Jew. Jesus read the scriptures. Jesus understood this. So Jesus followed by this also that only God is to be worshipped. And so therefore if Jesus was to take the worship that was to be attributed to God from other men, 
if, if men came up and worshipped Jesus as God, and um, if it was wrong for them to do so because he isn't God, then he would rebuke them for worshipping him, or otherwise he would be wrong. He'd be, he'd be sinning to take the worship that is only to be for God. And so, um, you know, we gotta we gotta realize that. Now I'm gonna go over some scriptures here. I'm gonna go over the next point, but uh, not talk a lot about the scriptures like I just did for those. Uh, I got my notes here. Let's see. Okay, basically, men of God. Refused worship, okay. So only God's to be worshipped, and then so therefore men of God refuse worship. And we see this in Revelation 22 8 and 9 it says, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down and worshipped before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God, he says. And so John was wrong to do that, okay? Um, but, you know, the, man, the one who refused the worship was the one that, you know, John bowed down to. And so even, you know, and that's another thing to show that... Uh, you know, even the apostles and the prophets and stuff, you know, they sinned and they made mistakes. You know, he should not have bowed down to that guy and worshipped him. Uh, but, uh, so, who he was uh, bowing to rebuked him. In Acts 14, chapter 14, verse 14 and 15, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach, un preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. And they're saying, you know, uh, <clears throat> you don't worship us, worship God. You know, we are men just like you. Okay, we are not immortal we're not divine basically in the sense you know that God is mortal right in Acts 10 25 and 26 and as Peter was coming in Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him but Peter took him up saying stand up I myself also am a man so these are all very similar accounts here Peter is uh, rebuking Cornelius for falling at his feet and worshipping him and he says, I'm a man, you know. He said, I'm a servant just like you. And so, uh, only God is to be worshipped. And men of God realize that. And uh, even though, you know, John made a mistake and, and these other, uh, you know, Cornelius, whoever else made mistakes, but basically, you know, they know the Old Testament. We know only God is to be worshipped. We should see that Herod died because he accepted worship that was only due to God. Okay? And I forgot to write the verses down for that. Sorry. What I just went over. So the point of me even white, writing this stuff on the whiteboards, if you're watching this video, then, you know, you can take notes or write these down. But So we had Revelation... 22, 8, and 9, and then we had Acts 14, 14, and 15, and then we had Acts 10, and verse 25 and 26. And so Herod died because he accepted worship. Uh, 
I'm not even trying really to write pretty right now. <laughs> I'm, re I'm stretching out all the way across the board. Um, and then, then this is Acts 12. 20 through 24. Okay. Here it was made an example of. In Acts 12, 20 through 24, and Herod, Herod, or Herod, sorry, Herod was, did I write Herod? Herod was highly displeased of them in Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king Chamberlain their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country and upon a set day Herod arrayed in royal apparel sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them and the people gave a shout saying it is the voice of a god and not of a man and so they were praising Herod as God and what happened next and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him why because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms, and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied, and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. So when these men worshipped him as God, he didn't deny. He didn't deny that worship. Herod was a Jew. He did not rebuke the men who worshipped him, and so God made an example of him. Okay. Now, obviously, this doesn't happen every time that, you know, somebody will accept the worship as God. Um, but this, but Herod was made an example of in the Old Testament, okay? And so uh, that's not to be done. <laughs> Only God is to be worshipped. And now we're going to see that Jesus is worshipped as God. Jesus is worshipped as God, and I'm going to go ahead and write the scriptures, like 7, 59, 2 Corinthians 12, 8, and 9. Hebrews 1 6 Revelation 5 12 Okay Now we're getting to the meat and potatoes of this, right? This is all about the deity of Christ How he is worshipped as God That's what we're going to talk about now So Acts 7:59 says, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So it says that Stephen called upon God. And what did he say? Jesus, receive my spirit. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. It is worthy of remark that Stephen, in his death, offered the same act of homage to Christ that Christ himself did to the Father when he died. In Luke 23:46. Luke said, Father, receive my spirit. Here, Stephen says, Jesus, receive my spirit. And so that's making uh, Jesus equal with the Father. Um, and it follows that Lord Jesus is the proper object of worship, that in most solemn circumstances it is right to call upon him to worship him and to commit our dearest interest to his hands if this may be done he is divine so that expressly um, that expresses <coughs> his divinity there you know it says he called upon God and then he says Jesus and um, so that's pretty clear right there that you know Jesus is divine and the fact that Stephen called upon him and, you know, said he was God and, 
and equating him with the Father. Second Corinthians twelve eight and nine says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, and for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And here is Paul uh, confining in Christ and calling upon Christ himself um, to relieve his infirmities. This proves that it is right to go to Christ in times of trouble, that it is right to worship him. Prayer is the most solemn act of adoration which we can perform. It is a sure proof of divinity. For only an omniscient being can be made an object of prayer, and no better authority can be required for praying divine honors to Christ than the fact that Paul worshipped him and called upon him to remove a severe and grievous calamity. And so that's interesting to note, too, that, you know, calling upon the Lord in prayer, um, you know, that would mean that who you're calling upon has to know your thoughts. They have to know all things. And, you know, so only God knows all things. And if he's calling upon Christ, saying that Christ knows all things, and therefore Christ is God. In Hebrews 1, six, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world... He saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. In this verse we see the angels of God worshiping him. And to worship any creature is idolatry. And God resents idolatry more than any other evil. Jesus Christ can be no creature. Else the angels who worship him must be guilty of idolatry. And here's an interesting thing. And God is the author of that idolatry who commanded those angels to worship Christ. So God created the angels to worship him. And so if the angels are worshiping Jesus, then God has commanded the angels to worship Jesus. And so if worshiping Jesus is wrong for them, if it's idolatry, if Jesus wasn't divine, then not only are the angels wrong in doing so, but then the Father, God himself, would be guilty of idolatry. So, you know... Um, like I said, when I went through that first chapter in Hebrews, that chapter is great for the divinity of Christ. And I think the fact that the angels worship him is really one of the strongest proofs. I mean, that's that's huge evidence of the divinity of Christ. And the last one, Revelation 5.12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So he says, worthy is the, the lamb that was slain. We know that this is referring to Christ. And he's worthy to receive worship. Or he's, well, he is worthy to receive worship. He's worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom, strength, honor, and glory and blessing. Power speaks of his omnipotence. His, he is all-powerful. Jesus is all-powerful. His riches, his uh, beneficence. <laughs> Basically, his riches, you know... Uh, his, uh, it could be a lot of things. You know, none of these things uh, that are mentioned here have to be really limited down because it's not exhaustive. It doesn't express everything, you know, that Jesus is or that all the attributes of Jesus or anything like that. You know, his riches, it could be, you know, his, his mercy and his glory or, you know, his, uh, you know, how, how high he is, um, you know, above everything else, basically. His, his uh, wisdom speaks of his omniscience, his, his all-knowing, his strength, um, again, his power and, and prevalent exercise, you know, um, honor, the highest reputation for what he has done, glory, the praise due to such actions, blessing, the thankful acknowledgments of the whole creation. It's hardly profitable to dwell on each of the seven receivables in this overwhelming doxology because even they do not exhaust the worthiness of the Lamb, but rather, and there being seven of them, the number of perfection, they stand for the infinite perfection and worthiness of Jesus Christ our Lord. Practically all of the qualities mentioned in this doxology are ascribed to Jesus elsewhere in the New Testament. And all of these only, only Jesus can receive, or I mean only God can receive, sorry, I mean... You know, that all power, you know, power, and, and he's worthy of, you know, wisdom, strength. So in this sense, you know, these are only, only God is worthy of this praise. And it's being 
ascribe to Jesus. And so therefore Jesus is God. Um, okay, let's see. Some of these I'll just go over quickly again. Uh, men of God worship Christ, and he did not deny them. So we've got Matthew 14 and verse 33, and then we've got John 9, 35 through 38. Okay. And in Matthew 14, 33, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. And he received that praise. He received that worship. So this is men of God worshiping him. Where, you know, these men knew, you know, I think probably a lot of them or all of them were Jews. They knew that only God was to be worshipped. So, you know, if he wasn't God, they'd be wrong in doing so. They'd be sinning. And if he wasn't God, then him accepting the worship, you know, like Herod did, then he'd be sinning. And so... You know, if you believe that Jesus, you know, is uh, <clears throat> was honest and everything, and you believe the scriptures are true, then, you know, we have to see that, you know, these men of God worshiping him and him not denying them is proof of his deity. In John chapter 9, verse 35 through 38, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believed, and he worshipped him. Again, same thing, uh, worshipping Christ as God. So, that proves his divinity, and we're going to see that he is there are scriptures that talk about how Jesus is entitled to equal honor with the Father. Okay, um, running out of room here. So he's entitled to equal honor with the Father. <laughs> I don't know why I'm writing it like this. This is just me being lazy, sorry. Okay, there's uh, quite a handful of scriptures here. Okay, there's a few of them. So we got John 5.23. We've got Philippians 2.10. We've got, which mm, mm, mm. basically, uh, what's the other one? I don't know. First Corinthians, one, two. Okay, basically, I guess that's it. That's all I'm gonna write down. So I'm noticing that. It's not even in the view of where I'm doing it now, so I'm going to uh, here, move the camera down a little bit there. Can you see that? Oh, the whole time that wasn't even in the view. Okay, let's back out then. Should have had this backed out anyway. Oh well. Sorry about that. Now you can see all that. So, um... John 5.23 says that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. That He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. So that's pretty clear words too. I mean, honor is basically the same as worship. I mean, it's, it's basically the same as, you know, serving him, fearing him, 
If then the Son is to be honored, even as the Father is honored, then the Son must be God, as receiving that worship which belongs to God alone. To worship any creature is idolatry. Christ is to be honored even as the Father is honored. Therefore, Christ is not a creature, and if not a creature, consequently the Creator. Philippians 2.10 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Isaiah 45 Verse 23 says, I have sworn by myself, uh, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me, <laughs> what did I, unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. I don't know what happened there, I just lost control of my body, I guess. That sounded weird. Basically, okay, so that's quoted, it's quoted in the Old Testament of God that every knee should bow and every tongue should swear. And then in the New Testament, we see that is attributed to Jesus. Thus, to Christ does the Father assign the worship which he solemnly under the Old Covenant, uh, covenant claimed as specially his own. Thus, God's stamp is put upon what Christ had said of himself. I and my Father are one. 1 Corinthians, verse 1 and unto the church of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours to call upon the name of any person in scripture language is to call upon or call on the person himself compare John 3.18 um, the note at Acts 4.12 the expression to call upon his name is to invoke his name implies worship and prayer and proves that one, the Lord Jesus is an object of worship, and two, that one characteristic of the early Christians by which they were known and distinguished was their calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus, or their offering worship to him, that implies that it implies worship. See okay. The Christians, the early Christians, they cried they they called on Christ by prayer. Okay. And they were distinguished by that. And so, yes. So Christians, uh, you know, have we... Christians are followers of Christ, but they also call upon Christ. And, you know, that implies worship. Or, I mean, that implies his divinity because to call upon him is to worship him. And so... There's that. Basically, that's the gist of it. That's it. And uh, so, hope you learned something. And I know this is basic stuff, and basically all Christians that have been saved for a while and been reading the scriptures should know a lot of this. But, uh, as I said, there's different angles that, you know, people may try to say that, you know, yeah, scripture says that he was worshipped, but that was just as Lord, or that was just as King. It didn't talk about his divinity. But I pointed out certain scriptures where it talks about Jesus is worshipped as God, we see that he's entitled to equal honor with the Father. That's the same thing. Um, men of God worshipped him, and, and he didn't uh, rebuke them, basically. So all this together, you know, it's very important. And uh, so that's that. I think I'm going to end this now. Thank you for watching. God bless.